And again, this is the end of the day on Friday, July 29th at the Oglethorpe County Library in Lexington. And I'm speaking with Mr. George Aaron. Yeah. And do you spell that A-A-R-O-N? Yes, sir. And Mr. Aaron, you live in Arnoldsville? I live now? in Arnoldsville, Georgia. And I'm interested in anything you care to, to share about the World War II era, about the time of World War II. And, uh, and I've been trying to forget it for 50 years. I know that's right. And there it is. But I went in in 1942, the long in the fall, at Atlanta, Georgia, and they sent me to Fort Polk, Louisiana, and put me in a tank division, 7th Armor. And I went through basic and trained on tanks. Went to California from there on the desert on maneuvers and stayed out there. I don't know how long, I can't remember <coughs> dates. And we moved back to Fort Benning, Georgia and trained there. And they moved us to Camp Shanks, New York, we got on the Queen Mary, had a whole division on that one ship. Moved us to Scotland. Got off in Scotland, got off on little, little trains, a whole about much as a wheelbar, and moved us to Tidworth, Tidworth <coughs> in Southampton, England. And then we started training they made the invasion long there somewhere, and I, I wasn't in it. Our division wasn't in it. We went to, uh, I believe it's northern France, and unloaded on Utah Beach. And the first action I saw was at St. Lowe. We made a hole in the line, and they poured us through it. And uh, we were spearheading the Third Army. And I remember Captain Verdon, because I got a medal there at Verdon. And we went on the Mets. We never did take Mets. They moved us out and moved somebody else in there. We ran out of gas and stayed out of gas, I think, about a week. And you could hear Patton cussing all over Europe because we wasn't moving. And I don't know exactly where we went from there, but when the bulls, they moved, we was in Germany, and I had read in the little star and stripes that all the German troops was clear of Belgium, wasn't any left. And they woke us up early one morning, ones that were asleep. And we loaded up and moved out. And they said we were going to Belgium. And boy, I was happy about going to Belgium. Wasn't no German troops there. But when I got there, they had to move back in. <laughs> so they, we pulled in a little old place called St. Vith. If you ever read about it, and was told to hold it at all costs, and we held it, and they went around each side of us and surrounded us. And I think we stayed surrounded from five, maybe seven days, I forget exactly. And then we broke out and went to Vivier's Belgium and waited on new equipment and replacements and exactly 30 days to the day we went back in it and took it back. There wasn't much left when we got back in it. But. And then we went on to the Roar Pocket. I could have brought you a film and showed you some of this. And then when the war ended, we was in uh, on the North Sea. Went through Czechoslovakia, part of us did. I don't remember if I did not. Like you say, 
you knew what was going on right in front of you, where you could see from the inside of the tank. And you didn't know what 200 yards on your right or on your left, you didn't know what was going on. And so I re-enlisted after the war and went back over and patrolled the border to let hitches up and then I got out the Korean War started. I had a kid brother who was at Fort Benning younger than me and he went to the Korean War. And so I enlisted, thought I could go over there too, but they sent me back to Germany and put me back on that border because I had experience, I guess. And I got out quick as I could that time. And then the Vietnam War started and I tried to go back and they wouldn't have me so I enlisted in the reserve and they volunteered through the reserve. Old Junior Fowler signed me up for the reserve and lo and behold they wouldn't send me, they sent me back to Germany then. One sent me, I never did go to Korea. But I did go to Vietnam twice, <clears throat> and people asked me when I got ordered, what are you going to do over there? They don't have no tanks in, in Vietnam, but by that I've done, <laughs> I've done some tanking for two years all together in Vietnam. Tell us about the tanks in World War II compared to what the Vietnam War was. How many men was in a tank? A lot of folks don't know. Well, they... He had a tank commander, a gunner, a loader, and a driver. Four people. Four people. Four, well, and they had a bi-grunt gunner. Had five in World War II. But in Vietnam, they had M48 tanks. They had four-man crew in each tank. But there was five in, in, in the old M4, the old Sherman tanks. But uh, I don't know how many, they got a 120 millimeter gun on this M1A1. They may have five people on it. They come out with a M103, which was a heavy tank between the Korean War and the Vietnam War. They didn't have many, had a, I forget what, what size gun was on them, but they had two loaders. What kind of engine did you have in the thing to propel the tank, and how fast would it go? In the M4, they, when I first went in, they had a nine-cylinder Pratt & Whitney radial engine, airplane type. The same thing they had in them old P-47s, they told me. But you had to, you had to hand crank it 27 turns to make it turn over one time, checking for a hydrostatic lock. You're probably familiar with that. That means the oil leaks down in the between the, the piston gas, and the cylinder. Gas gets down on them bottom cylinders and you start to crank it, it'll break a rod or bust the piston. But then they come, before the war ended, they come out with a M4A1 that had a V8 engine, forward engine, 500 horsepower. And I had one of them during the Korean War over there on the border, but... It knocked down a pretty good tree? Yeah, they pushed down a pretty good tree, and then they come out with the patent tank. Had a 12-cylinder, a V-12 Continental with an Allison cross-drive transmission married to it. You could, a good crew in 30 minutes could set that engine on the ground and work on it, crank it up with cables on your quick disconnects. It was air cool. And the M60 also had a diesel engine. Uh, they had gasoline until the M60 come out with diesel. And it had a Continental Diesel V12, and the same cross-drive what they call a cross-drive ammunition, a uh, transmission, you could change gear in it, 
without a clutch. It wasn't automatic. You had to change it, but you didn't need no, there wasn't no clutch in it. How about the food and so forth in the side of a tank? If you was a gin tank for four or five hours, did you get to eat the thing or? Well, if you had two or three boxes of sea rations or whatever you wanted in there with you, you could draw a ration. That was, every time you got a chance to get ammunition, they'd give you a case of sea rations to carry with you. You could open them up and use them. Did you ever give out a fuel or ammunition while you was in a battle? No, I always loaded up. I, I had about a double base of loads when I pulled out to go in battle. I had plenty of machine gun ammunition. I'd tie it on the racks on the outside and have it inside. The basic load on the M60, I believe, was 50... 54 rounds for the main gun. And the tank commanders, according to what you expect out there, you can take your pick on where you want it. Uh, AT or armor piercing or shot rounds. They had a, in Vietnam, they had a giant shotgun round. And I always was heavy on them. I, did, I never uh, encountered an enemy tank, so I always left all them armor piercing and took me a shotgun round. Now it was something else for about 250 yards, but that was about the limit on it. Did you shoot at what kind of targets? Mostly you say you didn't shoot at other tanks? Or shoot did you? at mostly men. Mostly men. Mostly men, personnel. Mm -hmm. Or you might see a truck or, or something like that, but you'd be in the jungle and you'd get hit and you couldn't see. You might be in a place no closer from here to 78 out there and, and when you'd get hit and you'd get hit on with uh, small arms, machine guns and mortar rounds. Then mortar rounds is what i try to pick out, cut them off. Did they ever shoot you with a bazooka? No, I know they get hit with one. They had some, but I know they get hit with one. The main thing, every tank I lost in Vietnam was hitting a mine. You hear a big swish and you look and you, your little road wheels that rolled on your tracks would be flying down through the woods. Did you get out and walk then, didn't you? Yeah, get out and walk. And I don't know, it's a heck of a way to make a living. <laughs> Did they use mines in World War II in the same way? Yeah, the first tank I was in got blowed up, hit a, a land mine. <coughs> but that's the only one that ever hit a mine. We was in France, wasn't no enemy around, and it got blowed up. What did you think of General Patton? I don't know, sometimes I liked him and sometimes I hated him. He didn't care how hungry you got, how cold you got, as long as you kept going, done what he wanted. They called him blood and guts. They used to say our blood and his guts. But when the bugs started, I would, we, they changed us to another army. I don't know. I forget now which one. It, I believe it was Hodges' first army. <laughs> we went in, in the Battle of the Bugs. Did you get stuck going across a swamp or a creek at any time? I got Where stuck. you pull each other out and stuff? I got stuck in Vietnam. I got a picture. You couldn't see the top of the tracks, and they went off and left me. Went on and left me. You could just see the turret and me and my crew. And, and I called him on the radio and told the platoon leader, I'm stuck. He said, say a little prayer. We'll be after you at daylight. It was getting dark in. And he went back to the fire base. And we sat on top of that tank all night. Me and the crew. 
And the next morning we saw a tank retriever coming and the gunner got in there <laughs> and started tracking it with the main gun <laughs> and I had to pull him out. <laughs> he wanted to take it out. <laughs> How big a gun was that barrel of? Was it three or four inches in diameter? Or? 90 millimeter. Uh, how many inches is that? Mm, a three inches and 76 millimeter, so that's about probably four, four. About four inches? About four inches. Uh, 75 millimeter is what I am four had, and they started putting 76s with a longer tube and higher velocity. And then they went to the 90. The Germans used 88. They had a famous 88 millimeter they used for anti-aircraft, anti-tank, anti-anything. They had the 88. It was a uh, universal, I guess. Did you use tracers in your machine gun? Every fourth round with the tracer, you could see where they was going and lead them in. You, you didn't sight, you just led your tracer in. Every uh, four and one. Ammo, that meant four, uh, one was a tracer. Were well, they 50 caliber or 30 caliber? Yeah, well, in World War II, you had a 50 and two thirties on the tank. And on the water in them, but uh, many a bath in a creek, and and I don't know how I come about it, but I got what they call an Australian shower. Uh, a little bag, a little canvas bag, hold about three or four gallons of water, and had a shower head under the bottom. You could twist it, take a shower under it, but most of the time we'd we'd take a shower in a creek or, and half of us stand guard while the other half took a shower and then have to pick pick uh, leeches off of each other. Leeches get all over you. I've never seen no ticks, never seen no chickens, but leeches were bad to get on. Did you get some, back to World War II, did you get some cold weather? Over there in those days? Yes, sir. It was cold. Like six inches of ice or snow? Yeah, snow in, in the battle of that buzz was six inches deeper, about <clears throat> maybe eight, ten. I, I, don't, I remember snow being everywhere. In the wintertime, it was in December and January. And now, uh, no, I ain't gonna say that. Feel free. Now I was gonna say what what Hubert said in the echo about Ardennes. That was the Battle of the Buds. He said right here. He went home right before it and and read it, read his piece of the echo. <laughs> I'm a I'm a member of the Veterans of the Battle of the Buds. I'm a lifetime member of the Seventh Armored Division and. I belong to the 25th Infantry Association, 4th Infantry Association. I was in combat with the 7th Armored in World War II, and in Vietnam I was with the 25th Infantry Division, 4th Infantry Division, and 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. Do you go to some of the reunions now, every year? Well, I did, but I don't, I don't got where I ain't able now. Is, uh, I got a little old paper from 7th Armored Division today and I seen where old Dennis Deacon. We were in California on the news, he turned the Jeep over. Upside down, it didn't hurt him, it throwed him out. Some of it didn't get hurt. And an old guy, he was from New York, and this old guy from Tennessee come by, he said, hey Deacon, and here's old Deacon worried to death, afraid he'd go out to pay the damage on that Jeep. Deacon said, what? He said, 
Get your grease gun out. Be a good time to grease it. All the fittings turned up where you get to it. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> I know old Deacon was going with it then when he said that. <laughs> That would have been a pretty good time, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, um, is there anything you'd care to add about your career? Um, what, what have you been doing since you've been out of the, the military at the end of Vietnam? Well, I retired out of the military. I was 53 years old. <laughs> I hadn't done no whole lot. I was living in Atlanta. Went back there and went to work for Ford and I worked till I got a chance to sell out and we sold out and came back over here. And it it is getting pretty rough like a combat zone in Atlanta. So we figured we better get out of there. It's bad that now. So, I hadn't done anything much. I did coon hunt a while, and uh, I came out of Vietnam with diabetes and an ulcer and a hiatal hernia in my ear, and then this air messed up. And my diabetes caused me to have a heart attack, and so I, I ain't able, they tell me down to Augusta, don't work. And they tell me in Atlanta, go to work when I try to get disability. So, I'm sort of between a rock and a hard place, and I don't know if I've done the right thing by going to Vietnam or not. Sometimes I think I shouldn't have went. Because everything wrong with me happened though. I get a little disability, but they deduct it from my army retirement. So it don't help too much. Well, is there anything else you'd care to add about the World War II era? Nah, I don't guess. If there's anything special you want to know about. If you were talking to young people about it, what would you tell them? I don't know really. I got one son, he never did go. I carried him around from army post to army post and I guess he got enough. He didn't he didn't go in the army. I didn't encourage him to. Cause I guess he he watched me go and I guess he got enough. I think he was about, oh, he, he was a young teenager when I went to Vietnam. I carried him to Germany with me. I went in at Fort Polk, Louisiana, went to California, come back to Fort Bend in Georgia, went to Camp Shanks, went from Camp Shanks overseas, and I re-enlisted and stayed over there. And when I come back, uh, when I re-enlisted the next time, they sent me to Fort Bragg, back to Germany, back to, I don't know where it is, and I got out again. And then when I went back, they sent me to, uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, Fort Bend in Georgia, back to Germany, back to Fort Riley, Kansas, to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, to wait a minute, I went somewhere to Vietnam. And the first time I went to Vietnam, let me figure out where I went from. Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Went from Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri to Vietnam and come back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Went from Fort Campbell back to Germany and then come back from 
Germany and went back to Vietnam. In that time when I came back from Vietnam, I went to the Fort Bliss, Texas and stayed there three years and retired. Same troop I was in one time in Germany, 3rd Armored Cavalry, put me in the same troop. I stayed three years, that made, give me five years in one unit. Long as I ever stayed in any unit. That's where I got my discharge at Fort Bliss. Fort Bliss, 1946. Biggs Field. Yeah. Biggs Field's still there. How long have you been living here in Oglethorpe County? I was born here in Oglethorpe County. Where was that? Uh, where was that? Ah, uh, go down here at Hogan store and turn left and go about a mile and turn right and cross Buffalo Creek back over there in the swamps. Uh-huh. My grandmother owned the place over there. When'd you move back? I moved back in, I think, 82. I want to get out of Atlanta. I believe it's 82, and I got it. Bobby's cousin down here, my daddy sharecropped on his aunt's place for, I believe, eight years, and that's where I learned how to work at. And I bought two acres. I got billed 72 acres that old place down there, Bobby, where me and Edgar used to hunt all the time. Well, um, I've got a phone call, and I don't have any more questions. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, that'd, that'd I'm, be okay. I'm very grateful for your time, sir. All right. Thanks for speaking with me.